The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anuj Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. I hope you're all well. Very annoyingly, I wasn't able to attend ICBC in Berlin last week. Heard it was a very interesting event and very hot like most of Europe at the moment. Excitement obviously seems very high about Germany and legalisation, but details remain thin on the ground. I think the smart commentary seems to suggest that it won't be in effect before 2024 at the earliest. In the UK, the government released a new white paper on drug policy. Whilst being couched in tough rhetoric, it's actually more progressive than it first appears. There's an emphasis on education to begin with rather than criminal sanctions for people caught in possession, at least uh, initially. Our Home Secretary is a truly dreadful person so she needs to sound tough to appeal to the conservative voter base however as we all know and the evidence overwhelmingly points to criminalizing small possession doesn't really help anyone so i'm glad that beneath the draconian sounding bluster there is some progression as ever vault have done some great commentary on this so please do check out their recent articles But back to today's show, we're talking about clinical research. This is obviously a subject that's close to my heart. A key reason for me joining Node Group was because I feel we need more robust evidence in order to convince more doctors and really open up access to patients in need. The team at Node have great experience designing and implementing clinical trials with both cannabis and psychedelics, as well as other plant-based medicines. We can also give strategic advice on where in the world to set up trials, as well as go-to-market and commercialization strategies. And additionally, the team have helped build clinics in these spaces too, such as cannabis clinics and ketamine clinics, which is something we also touch upon in the interview. So if you are looking at research, we would love to help. Please do come and find me on LinkedIn. Once again, this episode is sponsored by our good friends at Lumino. As mentioned before, Lumino have great experience in recruiting for clinics, clinical nurses, clinic managers, specialist doctors, amongst others. Uh, And Lumino have really seen how these organizations have developed over the years. So have great advice around this space. So as always, if you need help with HR or recruitment, please do get in touch with them at luminorecruit.com. And please mention my name when you do. Now on with the show. Enjoy. On today's show, I have Dr. Michael Sodergren. Michael is Senior Lecturer at Imperial College London and Managing Director at Sapphire Medical Clinics. Michael, welcome. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. No, real pleasure. You can probably hear some whirring in the background. I've got the fan on. We're all slightly melting here in London at the moment. Are you in London too? I absolutely am. And I just had a notification from Sky News saying that Today in London, we are hotter than 98.8% of the rest of the planet. So it is hot. Yes. Yeah. And we are really not used to it, are we? So <laughs> uh, It's an experience for sure, but difficult for many people to work, I would imagine. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. We've got a really good topic to talk about today about clinical trials. And this is a matter that's very close to my heart, as I've just moved to to work for a contract research organization so this is really timely but we'll get onto that topic in a minute i always like to start with you and your personal story you know what's your background and how and why did you get into studying and working with cannabis yeah so i'm a doctor by training so i'm an academic clinician so i've always been interested in in research in one way or another since i became a doctor and i chose that as a career pathway about 15 to 18 years ago. And what does that mean? That means that I still spend about one and a half, two days a week on direct clinical contact. So I'm a surgeon. My interests in surgery are liver and pancreas cancer. And so I spend one day a week operating on complex liver and pancreas cancers. And I have obviously a clinic attached to that and some other clinical activities. But the rest of the time, I do research. And I've been interested really since 
I started my research program at Imperial College, which has evolved over time, but I've always been interested in, in the biology of cancer, and in particular, what the interaction is between our immune system and cancer. And that's obviously come you know, to the forefront of, of medical research over the last decade with you know, the, the only Nobel Prize that's been awarded for a cancer therapy in my lifetime has been to the invention of immunotherapy, which is essentially that, harnessing the body's immune system to fight cancers. And so I think as a medical community, we came to the realization that we'd had this laser focus on trying to kill the cancer cells. But actually what this has showed us is that we should have looked much, much wider than that. And we should have looked at not just killing cancer cells, but how we harness our own immune systems to recognize these cells as, as foreign to us and how we enable our immune system to kill those cells in addition to therapies that kill the cancer cells themselves. And so I've been involved to a large extent over the last 10 years in techniques that we can use inside and outside of surgery to modulate the immune system. And those have sometimes been related to devices like radio frequency ablation and and really innovative surgical technologies. But through that journey, that led me to discover CBD. There's been some data around how CBD, not only is it a really powerful anti-inflammatory, which is, of course, all about an immune response, but it also has some interactions with the pathways that the common chemotherapy drugs use to combat cancer, in particularly in pancreas cancer, which is my main area of research. And so I started investigating how CBD can be used to help the conventional therapies, or if CBD can be used to help the conventional therapies that we have for pancreatic cancer. And this is really in the context of us not having many good options at all in pancreas cancer. It's still really a devastating disease with you know the vast majority of patients uh, not living five years past their diagnosis. And so I started a program really looking at, at those mechanisms in a Petri dish and seeing if we could really understand how CBD interacts with not just cancer cells, but also with the immune system in, within the tumor and within the, patient's, within the patient's body. And so we've taken that program through a series of quite conventional experiments where we start in a Petri dish and then we go to some in vivo animal experiments we extrapolate that data further, we gain some insights, then we go back and refine, etc. And so that's how my interest in medical cannabis started. But this is also on the backdrop of, as a surgeon, having been asked about the role of medical cannabis relatively frequently by patients for a long, long time. And this is particularly in the context of pain. Unfortunately, as a surgeon, you inadvertently cause a lot of pain and really a lot of the methods that we have to alleviate those in the short and long term aren't great. And they're associated with sometimes significant side effect profiles, but particularly concerning my clinical work, a lot of them really slow patients down in terms of the recovery. So we've been reliant on things like epidurals, which really, if we can use alternative methods to alleviate pain, would be really a benefit to patients and their recovery. And so the initial work that I did with cancer soon developed into a little program in its own at Imperial College, where we've also began investigating different pain pathways and what the different constituents of the cannabis plant that can be useful in combating both acute and chronic pain and all the different types of pain and how we combine those for the best effect and so on. And then finally, one of the things that has become really abundantly clear in the UK since the law was changed with regards to medical cannabis in 2018, is the fact that we're really going to need, you know, well-structured clinical trials for a number of different indications to take them to a stage where they're licensed and so then they can then be available on the NHS. However, that process is one that takes years and we haven't had the research infrastructure, we haven't had the industry support, and a lot of other factors, which means that this process, which I think has begun, but will certainly not be completed for another at least decade or two for the majority of conditions. And so that 
has meant that there is a real urgency in bridging the evidence gap. And so the final sort of research interests that we have in the Imperial College Medical Cannabis Research Group is around real world evidence and how we harness this kind of data, the data that we collect from patients being prescribed medical cannabis right now in the UK, and use that to better enable us to understand what the medicines do, but also to support dossiers for market authorization. And I think, you know, that's recently been vindicated, both level of the FDA and MHRA in the UK, where they've said that, you know, we're absolutely going to be looking at real world evidence to accelerate the way that we can develop many of these drugs. And so that's how my research portfolio at Imperial has been built. And those are the, those are the main interests right now. But there are so many interesting research topics that we're, we're always looking at. Yeah. Wow. Brilliant. Thank you. So many questions I want to ask there. One of them, I guess, is Imperial. So not only you work there and you're, you know, doing, doing your great work in relation to cannabis, they've obviously got a fairly impressive team on the psychedelics front as well. It sounds like quite an interesting place to be. And it's, you know, not necessarily all institutions would take the same approach. Have you got any reflections on that? Yeah. I mean, I think I've been there for, I've been there since 2007. So I obviously think it's a good place to do research at. I think that's largely because they have a very open view as to how we translate high impact research. And so one of the things that Imperial consistently ranks very high in globally is translation. So how do we take scientific discoveries in a Petri dish and translate them to direct patient benefit? And that's sometimes easier said than done. And so they have a very open mind on what the possibilities are around medical cannabis and have been extremely supportive with my research group. And that's really enabled us to, you know, produce some of the work in a relatively short period of time that we've been able to do. And it's largely because of support and I think a confidence that if you conduct science properly, then it doesn't really matter what's gone before. But if you're producing good data that scientists feel is valuable, then that is something that hopefully we'll be able to translate into human benefit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that objectivity is something that we all need in all walks of life, I think. So it's great to hear that you're in the right environment for that. And that kind of goes hand in hand with my next question is usual question around stigma. But, you know, there's obviously a number of your peers who maybe aren't as favorable to cannabis and for good reasons, maybe have, have had negative associations with it through their patients. Did you encounter much of that amongst your colleagues and or how did you sort of approach that? Yeah, I'd say that very little, to be honest. I think that there is a very clear recognition now in the medical profession that medical cannabis is legitimate medicine. You know, we have we have two licensed med medicines in the UK that are available in the NHS in the form of Pidilex and Sativex. And so there is, I don't think there are any, or I haven't encountered any doctors that would argue against the benefit of those medicines that are proven, you know, using the same methodology as we do for every other medicine that we prescribe. I think that there are obviously some negative associations by the way of it having been an illegal recreational drug, or it is a legal recreational drug, but that it wasn't considered to have medical benefit before 2018. But I think within the medical profession, that's largely not been a problem. I think that if you speak the same language as doctors, i.e. data, trials, scientific rigor, then it's very easy to convince someone that it has value if you can do it in that manner. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll come on to talk about that in a second. And that's brilliant summary. I could have just, we could spend the whole interview talking about all your work at Imperial. But tell us a little bit about Sapphire before we kind of go into the main topic. Yeah. So Sapphire Medical Clinics was essentially, uh, it was something that myself and a group of clinicians at Imperial at King's College founded just after the law changed in 2018. And it was really a realization that whilst the law had changed and there was a set of guidelines and recommendations on how to implement this clinically, there hadn't really been the groundwork laid to do it in a robust and a way that was probably in keeping with what we have seen happening, large number of patients seeking treatment with unlicensed medicines. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to focus on, on two main aspects. One was to set up a structure with a very high level of clinical governance. And so that means that we prescribe 
medical cannabis to patients at the right stage of their treatment pathway, to those who have tried the licensed medicines, really where where the evidence base leads us to believe that cannabis-based medicines fit in right now. And so the way that we've also structured that is that no patients are have a decision made around their treatment by a single doctor. And this is this is a concept which is very common for treatments like cancer in the NHS. So this is exactly the way I treat my pancreas cancer patients. All the clinical decisions, whether to treat or not, are made by a committee of specialists. And so at Safar, we have a multidisciplinary team of doctors. We have clinical pharmacists that sits above that, etc. And it's through that forum that we discuss each patient discuss where they are in the treatment pathway, what the relevant evidence is for that condition, and then we make a a recommendation whether to treat or not. And that process has been really great because it means that doctors feel comfortable with the system, they're used to that system, but also patients find it reassuring that, you know, there's a, a group of reputable clinicians who are involved in their care. And equally, regulators and policymakers find it comforting because this is the process that we use in the NHS for high-risk conditions such as cancer. So that was number one. Number two was that we realized that if we were going to prescribe relatively large volumes of unlicensed medicines to patients whilst we wait for drugs to be developed along the usual drug development pathways, then it would be irresponsible if we didn't record that data in a meaningful way. And so we set up what we ambitiously called the UK Medical Cannabis Registry right from the very outset. We spent a lot of time making sure that it was as comprehensive as possible. And so what we record is not just information about the patients and the demographics and the past medical history, but also the clinical efficacy measures that go together with their treatment, patient reported outcomes that are either condition specific or general we collect adverse events, so side effects, in the same way as we would in a phase one clinical trial, for instance, so the data is directly comparable, amongst a number of other things. And so this means that we have a really rich source of clinical outcome data that has meant that we've gained a lot of insight in the short period of time since we've been able to prescribe. And Sapphire Medical Clinics was the first medical cannabis clinic that was registered with the CQC, which is the regulator in, in England. We're also the first to be registered with the regulator in Scotland, which is his. And we've seen really a great uptake from healthcare professionals in that they feel that it's it's a great format for patients to be referred for a discussion as to whether these medicines may be appropriate or not. But also, as expected, we've seen many patients seeking treatment. And so right now, we've got more or less 600 new patients per month seeking treatment The vast majority of those are for pain or psychiatric conditions such as anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. And these numbers are increasing month on month. Wow, that's impressive. And thank you for the the summary. It's great how you're sort of those two dual tracking approaches to this. And it kind of leads nicely into the main topic, which is around clinical research. As I usually kind of like to do this, it'd be good to get kind of a little high level of how clinical research works in general without going into huge amounts of depth. But, you know, everyone's aware of the terms phase one, phase two. Maybe you can just give us a brief overview of of the normal path and then we can dig in a bit deeper how it applies to cannabinoids. Yeah, absolutely. And so the usual drug development pathway is that you usually you have a, a single molecule or a single active pharmaceutical ingredient that you take through some laboratory tests. So that's tests in the Petri dish ensuring that, number one, that it has the effects that you think it has on the on the cells and the signaling pathways, etc. And then you take that forward to in vivo experiments that not just document safety in animals, but also pharmacodynamics, which is the interaction with the target that it does what you think it should do. The pharmacokinetics, which means that when you dose someone, you understand what that means for the blood levels of the compound, the active pharmaceutical ingredients. And once you've reached a stage where you've completed that preclinical work, then you go into clinical research. And clinical trials are essentially relatively simple to understand conceptually. And they're what you just said. There's phase one, two, and three. Phase one is really about safety. 
And the outcome measures that you look at are side effects, if you have to decrease the dose because patients are experiencing side effects, if there are drug-drug interactions, etc. So they're really based about on, on safety. Then you go into phase two and three, which are more about showing that they have efficacy, i.e. they work for a certain condition. And so that means that you're likely comparing this to either a stranded treatment or comparing it to a placebo, which is an inactive treatment, of course. And once you get to the end of that, of stage three, you have a trial where, which is powered, and power is the term that we use to illustrate the statistics behind the number of patients you have to recruit to show definitively that one treatment is better than another or that one treatment is non-inferior to another. And then once you get to that point, then you're in a position to complete a dossier whereby not just in addition to these trials but and the preclinical work, you have a number of different other facets that you need to show to be able to license a medicine in the UK with the MHRA. Fantastic. And that actually leads me to the next question. Was So you mentioned the MHRA. Is the regulator involved the whole way along? As in, do you have to kind of get sign off from them for the design, etc.? No, you don't have to. But it's if you are licensing a drug, it is absolutely advisable to seek the support and advice once you get to the clinical trial stage, because particularly the latter parts of clinical trials are very costly. And it may be that they are looking for a certain type of outcome measure to allow you to license medicine, or they're looking for a certain type of trial design. So it is absolutely advisable to get their involvement beforehand so they can advise you on the best trial methodology, etc., for it to be something that they would recognize and think is robust in licensing it as a new medicine. Yes. You want to make sure you're on the right track before you commit lots of money. And actually, we talked about the clinical research side of things, but it might be worth elaborating on what the preclinical side of things are. And is is that kind of essentially zeroing in on a, a specific molecule that you want to take forward to the trials? Well, that's the normal drug development pathway in medicine. Obviously, cannabis is very different because in many ways or in many of the formats that we're looking at cannabis, it's not just a single molecule that has the effect on the human body. But in normal drug development in medicine, it's relatively straightforward in that you have one API active pharmaceutical ingredient. And that's tested in a variety of different ways preclinically. Like I said, first of all, you want to make sure that there are things like genotoxicity, that it doesn't interfere with someone's genetic makeup, you know, which is a very basic thing, obviously, can be done preclinically, to showing that the target that you're engaging is actually the one that's engaged and has downstream effects in signaling pathways and so on. And so there's a whole range of different preclinical work that needs to be done before you can confidently take a new molecule or a new medicine into clinical tests. Now, medical cannabis is obviously slightly different to that, but that is how the usual drug development pathway works. Yeah, and that's good timing. So digging in on cannabis... I mean, the typical drug development, the API side of things, as you described, is usually single molecule and maybe often synthesized. That is quite different to cannabis. How do we adapt cannabis to this model or do we adapt the model to cannabis? Where's the challenge there? Yeah, very good question. So the complexity around cannabis is relatively simple in that there are potentially a large number of APIs, active pharmaceutical ingredients, that can be contributed to its effect in human health. And so if we understand that, then we have a number of different options available to us. The first, which is relatively simple to conceptualize, is that, well, we have to do some work to understand which or which combination of these molecules it really is that's contributing to human health. And then if we do that, we can isolate those and take them down a similar pathway to what we do with other drug development. Now, that's probably easier said than done in many ways. One of the slides that I usually show when I lecture students about cannabis is that we have about 140 different cannabinoids in the plant. There's also, you know, over 100 terpenes, flavonoids, etc., etc. But if we were to just focus on the 140 cannabinoids, then if you do a simple calculation to work out how many different permutations, just permutations you can have 
of these 140 cannabinoids, you reach a number that when I put it on the slide to show the students, they usually laugh and they quickly understand that that number is not one that's probably possible to exhaustively research in a lifetime. And so we have to be a little bit pragmatic in our approach. And so then you go back to the point where you think, right, if the starting point is that we believe that a cannabis extract has a benefit on human health, but it is very difficult for us to isolate the exact one, two, three, four chemicals that are contributing to this, then how can we still make use of this extract to help in disease whilst we are doing this research in the background, which is likely to last decades until we figure out all the properties of the cannabinoids and other constituents of the plant? And then that becomes an interesting question about how we license these drugs. And I think that the I mean, the MHRA, we've had some conversations with the MHRA about what the most likely routes are, because I think that there's a, there's certainly a willingness on behalf of the regulators in the UK, and I believe elsewhere, to get these medicines out of the unlicensed space if possible. And so what does that look like? Well, that may look like a hybrid model between botanical medicine licensing and what we think of as traditional drug development licensing with certain elements being replaced by things like real-world data, historical data from other trials, et cetera. But I think think that that's the way that we're heading in the UK. Yeah, I mean, there's so much there. One of the things that struck me, and it's, you know, it's a repeated kind of a bugbear in the industry, I suppose, is, is the traditional drug development route is still around isolating molecules when and I'm not going to dwell on the entourage effect because I think that's been used out of context a lot of the time and the evidence is, you know, is not maybe not there yet. But, you know, holistically, it probably takes a few different things that contribute to something that's like greater than the single thing individually. How do we kind of square those circles, if you like? Yeah, no, I mean, 100%. And so, I mean, one of the interesting things that we've been doing in the lab, just looking at pain research is we've set up quite a well-established in vitro neuropathic pain model. So we take dorsal root gangrene neurons, you know, nerve cells from rats or sometimes from humans that are being operated on through injuries. And we're able to excite those using various methods, including capsaicin. And then we add molecules to see if that changes the excitation, as it were, along the neurons. And we use things like calcium channel imaging and various other methods to quantify that. And so one of the really interesting things that we've been able to look at is in this model, when we combine CBD, CBG, and THC, we require less concentration of THC to reach the same response in terms of what we would hopefully result in in relief of pain. And so that's just looking at three cannabinoids. And so there is definitely an interaction between these molecules that on the face of it, just looking at this data that we've now published, appears beneficial, right? Because particularly for a painkiller, one of the things that we want to try to avoid are some of the adverse events associated with THC, the side effects such as drowsiness, et cetera. And so if we can decrease the doses of THC, that's that lead to the same analgesic response that's obviously going to be beneficial. And so I think that there is widely an acknowledgement that there are interactions between these molecules that could be beneficial. And so how do we then recognize that down a regulatory pathway and leverage the fact that we see some clinical signals associated with these extracts or these different combinations of cannabinoids? And I think that's work in progress that I have no doubt will be solved over the next five years or so. But as I said before, I think it's it's about being a bit creative, but it's also about having a willingness to to innovate along the regulatory pathway. But what I don't think it means, and what I don't think will be accepted by the medical profession, is that we do not use the same rigorous methodology in terms of trials to prove that this extract has the desired clinical effect. Well, yeah, again, there's loads there. I mean, do you think the regulations or the regulatory system of RCTs do you think that might need to be re- re-looked at? Because again, the focus is you can only really do those things in specific circumstances, predominantly single molecule, 
it's difficult to blind these things and you know particularly when thc is concerned D- does that model need to be adapted I, that's a big big question but yeah you know i think that it, it is an open question but i think that you know in terms of blinding and thc all you know the majority of opioid painkillers have the same issue in terms of blinding many many medicines that we use have recognizable side effects that have problems with blinding and so I don't feel that we can use that as an excuse to exempt medical cannabis from randomized controlled trials. Sure. And what I would probably say to those who say that we can't do randomized controlled trials, medical cannabis, I'd say that designing such a trial is relatively straightforward. It's very, if I have extract A and I would want to compare it to morphine, that such a trial design is relatively straightforward to do and one that would be more recognized by the medical profession rather than alternatives. Now, there is a wider debate around the gold standard of randomized controlled trials as a methodology to determine efficacy in medicine. But I think that it would it clouds the issue somewhat to involve medical cannabis in that debate. That should be a standalone debate and one that should absolutely take place. But the argument that medical cannabis is somehow exceptional I think we would need much more justification for it to be acknowledged uh, by the medical profession. Yeah, and that's a really good answer. I think what I see as a major blocker in this industry is the lack of recognition by the medical fraternity at large. And in order for it to develop, we need more physicians that are open to prescribing it. And behind that is they need more data to be convinced, if I'm reading it right. Yeah, and absolutely. And it starts with safety, you know, and this is where the real world data that we're looking at, I think, is so powerful because one of the starting points when you receive a, a new medicine as a doctor that's that's unlicensed, which puts you in an uncomfortable space to start off with, because the vast majority of medicines that we prescribe as doctors are licensed. And that means in England, we can look up everything about them in the British National Formula, which is the little book that tells us about side effects, uh, contraindications, drug-drug interaction, dosing, etc. We have none of that for unlicensed medicine. So you're starting off in a slightly uncomfortable space. So what do you need to make yourself comfortable? Well, this kind of real-world evidence data that supports safety is really paramount to that. And then, of course, you know, it is, of course, we cannot say that medical cannabis has a causality based on observational cohort data. But what we can say is that whatever is happening, the patients that get this group of patients that are getting this treatment have an improvement in their quality of life, if that's the case in in, this particular cohort or so on, which, as I said, does not prove causality, but should be reassuring in its own right. Yeah, and I guess that is the kind of the first port of call is the safety profile. And so if doctors can get comfortable with the there's a low risk of issues with this, then it almost, I don't know, I guess it's worth trying. And actually this leads on to the the real world evidence bit, because that, as I understand it, doesn't fit very well into a clinical trial model. It's not as robust. How do those two live together? Yeah, so it's a good question. And one of the things that's happened, you know, a couple of years ago in the US with the FDA, but only last year here in the UK with MHRA, is that that they've released official guidance around real world evidence. And the headline from their guidelines was that essentially we are willing to accept real world evidence to accelerate drug development. So what does that mean in practice? Well, we're not sure about medical cannabis yet because we haven't had any drug candidates that that have gone through the process fully. I'm sure we will soon, but we haven't yet. But what I think it means is that we may not need some of these clinical trial data to support safety if we have large real-world evidence data sets of thousands and thousands of people that have robustly collected safety data to show, instead of this particular type of clinical trial, we may not need to do non-human primate uh, safety data as we would with any other molecule because we have this kind of data set. So I think where real-world evidence will sit will be alongside some conventional trial data in a dossier which will make it faster and hopefully easier to get cannabis-based medicines approved. Yeah, I like that approach. And that's that sounds very sensible to me. I, I wasn't actually going to ask this question, but it feels like a kind of right to ask, how do you feel about cannabis flower as a medicine? I always sort of think about it in the terms of 
cannabis flower has medical properties, but cannabis flower might not necessarily be a medicine. And by that, I mean the inherent variability of it, of different cultivars, and then, you know, different buds on the same plant can have different composition, whether they're closer to the light or more ventilated, etc. The consistency aspect. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I think the the starting point is that it's not a mode of administration that doctors are particularly comfortable with for a number of different reasons. One is not one that we're used to in terms of dosing. Then, you, as you say, you have great variability within the plant itself. The underlying problem, of course, is that we don't have alternatives at the moment. And so for those patients who require a medicine with fast onset of action, and so maybe those pain patients who have very acute episodes where the sublingual oils would simply take too long to work, then they may have symptomatic relief because within the flower, you do have the the constituents of the medicine that helps them with the caveat that yes, there is variability and all of the other issues that you've just mentioned. And so I think that as a form, as a, a mode of administration, it's one that has merit at the moment, but it's one that is uncomfortable with doctors and one that as we learn more about the plant, learn really about what it is that has benefits to human health, will be refined to something that is much more resembling the medicines that we prescribe for many conditions, such as inhalers, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you. So my last question will be around like looking forward to the future. I mean, one of, one of my kind of laments is a lot of companies claiming to be medical cannabis companies in the space, but they aren't really talking to many patients or investing in research. Obviously, we're here to talk about research. What do you think are the things that could maybe help kick that on? Investment is obviously a, a key aspect of that. Yeah, it is. And, and I think that, you know, if your business is the development of medicines, you need to be involved in the R&D space in one way or another. Now, I think medical cannabis is a very different <laughs> type of drug development in that, yes, we're able to, in many countries, prescribe these medicines as unlicensed or magistral preparations, incentives. For, to, to go down a traditional drug development route. I think that what we need are obviously more investment and more resources for these companies who wish to, to go down that route. But also, I think, which I'm starting to see develop in the UK, is a greater investment, not just in terms of finances, but infrastructure to make research happen with academic collaborations. So really bringing together governments, academic institutions and the private sector to create sense of excellence where we have the resources available to develop these products, which may not be something that individual companies now are resourced to do or have the incentive to do. But if they could be done under this kind of umbrella, it would result in benefits for all the parties involved. So I think that's the hopefully that's the structure that we're hope, starting to see emerge. Yeah, absolutely. We'd like to see that. And so as those things develop, it would be great to have you back on to chat about them in the future. Absolutely. Michael, it's been really, really super interesting. And we could have talked a lot more about any number of aspects, but great to have this sort of overview. So very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on. Cheers. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast. It will help me spread the good word on how this amazing industry is developing. I work with various cannabis startups to help them get funded and grow. I also work with corporates and international cannabis companies to help them understand and navigate the European cannabis sector. We're working with some great clients across the cannabis value chain and we'd love to help you too. Please visit www.canverse.global to get in touch.